As I was preparing for this session today, um, I realized that I'm going to be in the uncomfortable position of basically mispronouncing my own name to a bunch of Dutch people. Uh, I've been getting this question all day long. I am half Dutch. My father was born here, but uh, I'm Canadian. I grew up there. So my name is Peter Mark Verward, which is how we pronounce it over in Canada. I know I'm mispronouncing it. Um, I'm on the uh, solution architecture team here at Google Cloud. And what I usually do and what I spend a lot of t my time with is helping customers um, migrate to the cloud, whether coming from data centers, uh, other private clouds, and so on. Um, and what we end up spending a lot of time on is actually data and databases. It's always kind of top of concern uh, with a lot of customers. And what that actually ends up meaning is that I talk about Cloud Spanner a great deal. Um, one more thing, I know I'm the very last session before cocktail hour, so I'm going to try to be as efficient as possible with my time, especially considering our small delay. Um, I don't want to be the only thing between uh, a group of people and some drinks. So off we go. And so what I'm going to try to cover today is uh, a brief history of Spanner, why it was created, um, what was the motivation at Google, um, what is Cloud Spanner as it has been released today, um, how does it work, how does it compare to other things, and then finally, um, a brief uh, demo that we better get to considering all the work that went into it. Um, so why does Spanner exist? And to get to that, you really have to go back to about 2005. Um, at the time, um, pretty much every dollar that Google generated was based off of AdWords. Um, and AdWords was backed by a manually sharded MySQL database. And that database uh, was sharded on customer keys, or customer IDs rather, and as we grew, we had to reshard that database. And we had to reshard it a lot because we were growing really quickly. Um, and the reshards were getting increasingly painful um, to the point where the last one actually took several years, literally, to complete. Um, at that point, we said, you know, this is um, untenable. We can't continue this way. There has to be something better. And so something better led to essentially the development of Spanner. And so while we were planning out what eventually became Spanner, we had to sort through what our requirements were. And essentially, at that time, those were what were AdWords requirements. And so there were three big ones. First, it had to be a horizontally scalable database. This was the problem we were encountering already with MySQL. We had to solve for that. And so we needed something that could scale with us. We had gone from a $10 million uh, a year company to over a billion dollars a year um, in such a short time. And we knew the scale wasn't ending. Uh, it was only going to be more and more. And so we had to be horizontally scalable. Second we had to have asset transactions. We were dealing with money, budgets, customers, partners, agencies. We had to be sure that any transaction that got written to the database was a strong transaction. We couldn't deal with eventual consistency. Um, we couldn't accept data loss. We had to have asset transactions in consistency. And then finally, we couldn't afford downtime. AdWords was the thing that was driving Google uh, all of Google at the time. So every minute, every second that AdWords was down meant lost revenue to Google. And so downtime was unacceptable for any system that we were creating to replace the existing one. So we had to have uptime. Um, and so if you look at these three requirements um, and think about what was available at the time, there was really nothing uh, that could fit those requirements in the market until Cloud Spanner. And so that brings us to what Cloud Spanner is. And if you could play the video now, please. We demand a lot of our databases. And our databases demand a lot of us. They're fragile, expensive, and tough to maintain. When things break, it can be hard to put the pieces back together at the speed of your business. And you often lose data in the process. We've all come to expect that distributed databases can't be globally consistent and scalable. But what if you didn't have to make trade-offs? What if you could have a fully managed database service that's consistent, scales horizontally across data centers, and speaks SQL? This is Cloud Spanner, a mission-critical relational database service built from the ground up and battle-tested at Google for strong consistency and high availability at global scale. At Google, we use Spanner for services that billions of people access every day. It's the only cloud service designed to be a massively distributed relational database with transactions and SQL semantics. And we're talking massive. 
Spanner can scale up to millions of machines across hundreds of data centers and trillions of database rows, stretching across the globe while behaving like it's all in one place, where you want it. We've built Cloud Spanner to be fully managed and secure. Automatic sharding and synchronous replication with low latency and schema updates without downtime means your data is highly available and reliable. Instead of endless provisioning and worrying about maintenance, you can focus on growing your business. No matter your needs, you don't have to hit a wall with your database service. Get started with Cloud Spanner and build what's next. All right, so I'm just here to introduce that video. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Kidding. Um, so that's kind of just an overview of what Cloud Spanner does. Um, and when you dive into it, what is kind of Cloud Spanner and, and how does that relate to what Spanner was as an internal product? Um, so first of all, Spanner is a fully managed uh, database service, which means that you don't have to worry about upgrades, patching, security, um, keeping it online, or anything like that. That's all done by our own site reliability engineering team that makes sure that uh, Spanner is up 24 seven. Um, as you may imagine, uh, we get fairly pedantic at Google, actually about a number of things. Um, but one of them is about what does uh, consistency mean and what does global consistency mean? And for us, uh, it means external serializability. And that's the highest standard for what global consistency means. Um, and there's a lot of kind of discussion inside the industry about eventual consistency versus global and what really that is versus what's acceptable. Um, for us, we had to set the highest bar possible for what our needs were and Spanner meets that bar. And so that means that you get asset transactions um, across many rows, you have relational semantics, you've got um, DDLs that you can create tables, you can do inserts, updates, deletes, uh, queries using SQL. Um, and in fact, you can use the same SQL that's already available across um, Google Cloud Platform for uh, BigQuery. So ANSI SQL 2011 with some extensions is the same SQL that you use in BigQuery that you can also use um, on Cloud Platform. We also have automated uh, synchronous replication. Um, as of today, so we have regional uh, spanner, so you can create regional instances of spanner, and those are within a single region spread across many zones, and that gives you four nines of availability. And so when you write to spanner, no matter where you're writing it within the region, you know that write is accepted and committed. Um, and later this year, we will be rolling out um, multi-regional spanner, which actually gives you a higher level of av availability. That gives you five nines of availability, which is about two seconds of downtime per month. Um, and so that's gonna be coming later this year. And finally, we've been using this internally at Google for nearly 10 years. This is battle tested. This has been run on production systems for a long time. And the reason I can kind of get up here and make these claims about consistency, about availability, is because we've been doing this for so long. We've got the data, we've got the history to know that we can stand by these claims. Um, and in fact, in addition to AdWords, which has been using Spanner since it went into production, there are a lot of other systems at Google that use Spanner as well. So uh, the Play Store uses Spanner. Um, Google Cloud Platform, in fact, also uses Spanner. Uh, the data plane that um, maintains uh, all the VMs across Cloud Platform actually runs on top of Spanner. So I kind of just said a lot of things about how it works and sort of ways it doesn't work, but in a more concrete sense, what does that kind of mean? So I think it's useful to compare it to both uh, relational databases and NoSQL databases, which is where we often get the most questions. So if you compare it to a relational database, um, Spanner has SQL, Spanner does schema updates, it has strong consistency. Um, and where the comparison gets interesting is we often get uh, questions like, well, how does Spanner compare to my RDBMS, uh, you know, MySQL, Postgres, whatever it is. Um, and that sometimes can be an apples and oranges comparison because when you talk about an RDBMS, um, you're usually talking about a single node system where, um, where all the reads and writes are going through a single node, a particular node. Um, and Spanner is a distributed system. And so with a single node system like that, um, 
if you've got any issues like uh, you know unexpected downtime, like unexpected failure of a node, um, you have to do security patches, you have to do an upgrade, you have downtime with that system. And you can create uh, alternative strategies where you have things like um, master master slaves or uh, read slaves where you fail over um, and those alleviate the downtime, but there is still downtime that is incurred. And with Spanner, again, part of our design requirements was that we couldn't have downtime. And so there, there was that kind of, um, there's that kind of change and that difference there. Um, and so basically uh, the strategy for, for Spanner becomes, it's a, it's a horizontal strategy for scaling. Meanwhile, with a single node database, you've, your strategy is vertical scaling. Um, you gotta say, you know, I need a bigger box, I need more RAM, I need more memory, more disk, what have you. I hope the provider I have has a bigger VM because we're hitting the limits on our database. With Spanner, that, that issue's gone. It doesn't have that problem anymore. Um, now, the other thing you can do to scale a relational database is add read replicas. And so you alleviate that load on top of a master database, on, the, on top of the master node, you spread the reads out to the read replicas, you increase your capacity of the master node. But then you have to deal with replication lag. And so if you have to be sure, you have to be positive that what you're reading is the most consistent view, you can go back to the master to get the most con consistent view, but then you're consuming the resources that you had set aside for writes. Um, and so that's a situation that just doesn't happen with Spanner. And on the other hand, uh, with uh, non-relational databases, um, we often see the situation where we go to customers, um, kind of large and small across the board, where we see a very familiar pattern. Um, an application is created, uh, it has a relational database on the back end, the application grows for whatever reason, becomes very popular, it starts storing a lot of data and so on. At a certain point, the relational database is replaced by a NoSQL database, uh, Cassandra, MongoDB, whatever it is. Um, and when that decision happens, it is usually done by saying, our top priority in this change is horizontal scalability. So we're willing to sacrifice consistency if we can get that scalability. And so that trade-off is made, and then you start pushing all this logic that once existed by the nature of the database into the application. So you're starting to create consistency within an application, which is introducing more complexity, more maintenance, more bugs, um, for the sake of gaining horizontal scalability. And with Spanner, you don't have to make that trade-off. You can continue to scale horizontally, but you still have consistency, you still have asset transactions. One of the things we get asked a lot about is what was the hardest part of bringing Spanner from an internal product to a cloud product? Um, and I think what it, one of the things that we worked hardest on was making it open. So Google's very much about being an open cloud and meeting you where you are with the tools that you already use. And so we tried to inject this um, across the board into Cloud Spanner. Um, so the first thing we started with was uh, using standard SQL. Like I said earlier, um, this is the same SQL uh, dialect that is spoken by BigQuery right now. Um, a couple years ago, we looked at our products. We said we were kind of, honestly, we were kind of all over the map with um, SQL standardization. So we decided to standardize ANSI SQL 2011 extensions, and that is currently used by BigQuery, and now it's also used by Spanner. And so we wanted to make sure we standardized that and made it a familiar language for anyone who's making that transition. Second, we, had, we spent a lot of time on enterprise features. So at launch, uh, Spanner launched back in March. When it launched, it launched with the most, I think, features uh, of any of our new products uh, had ever launched with things like um, encryption, identity access management, logging, all these sorts of things that um, any kind of standard enterprise would be interested in and be required to use a database in production. And Spanner launched with those on day one. Um, the third was to make Spanner an appealing target for developers. We want to be a developer-friendly platform. And in order to do that, we really think there are, there are two kind of essential things. One, you have to have great documentation, and two, you have to have good libraries. And so for the documentation, um, Spanner was actually in early access for over 12 months. Uh, so we have an early access program uh, with um, some customers, and that was, it was there for over a year. And among the many things that we did with our early access customers was actually refine our documentation. They told us where the holes were, where the gaps were, things didn't make sense, things weren't explained well enough, and we iterated over and over and over on that documentation. And it really helped a lot to be able to make the documentation at launch really first class. 
Alongside that, pro uh, that process was developing client libraries. So we really wanted to launch with um, a wide variety of popular platforms, or popular languages, I should say, um, with, uh, with our libraries. And so we launched with Java and Python and Node um, and Go. And those are really first class libraries. What we've done with those is try to make it as easy as possible for developers who are familiar with those languages to get started and start using Spanner in a way that's familiar, in a way that is natural in that language. We've abstracted away a lot of kind of the subtle um, intricacies of connecting to Spanner, of using the API in a way that makes sense for each particular language. And then finally, we launched with a JDBC driver. So we knew it was important for Spanner to be able to connect to existing tools, especially existing BI tools. Um, and so we launched with a JDBC uh, driver that's read-only. And so what that means is you can connect your Spanner um, instance to tools that you already use, that you already have, and to be able to read the data off of there. And so that's the kind of thing that you could do for customers, whether they're internal or external, if they want to read the data, if they want to connect to the data, if they want to build reporting off that data, that is something they can do with that JDBC driver. So the type of workloads that we expect uh, most customers to use with Spanner um, mostly fall into these four categories. And this is something that we saw in the early access and something that uh, we've seen since uh, Spanner has launched. And the first is transactional, and this isn't really surprising at all. It is a relational database. Um, it has strong uh, transactional requirements, strong transactional capabilities, I should say. And so we see a lot of transactional use cases, which is not surprising. If you've got a use case where you're selling something, you can't sell more than you actually possess, or you want to record transactions, you want to record financial transactions, um, Spanner is a great use case for that. Um, and we saw this happening a lot, especially in those cases where um, companies had, in order to maintain a certain size or a certain scale, um, they had built in a lot of consistency logic into an application database, or into an application rather than the database. And Spanner being able to take on that, um, that logic uh, from the application and being able to um, lighten the load on development and bug maintenance. Second, scale out. Um, so we often uh, find ourselves kind of um, trying to answer the question, do I have to have a minimum data set size to use Spanner? Does it have to be you know, hundreds of terabytes so I can really efficiently use it? Absolutely not. You can start using um, Spanner and, and start getting a really good use case out of Spanner, even at very like, small, like say, single digit gigabyte size databases. Because part of the advantage of Spanner is not just storage. The, the advantage here is that you're gaining this availability and you're gaining the um, consistency of that availability spread across a region. And so if you've got some kind of mission critical database, if you've got something that you have absolutely have to have the highest level of availability possible, if you've got something that you know, cannot go down if at all possible, um, and it's got to be relational, it's got to be um, stored uh, reliably, Spanner is a great use case. And this is something that you know, we see a lot of customers using where they really relied on the availability rather than the size and the scale uh, in order to um, use for their applications. Third, uh, and this is a very, very common use case at Google, is a global data plane. If you've got um, a user base, let's say you've got a global user base, you've got users in uh, the States, you've got users in Europe, you've got users in um, Asia, and they all log into the same application. But you're sharding along the, that geographic user database. Um, so you keep a database in each one of those three um, regions, and those users are home there. When a user logs in, you've got to figure out how to send them to the right home. So even if you're homed in the right place, how do you know where that person's home is? And so you've got to have some sort of meta database to be able to describe where to go. And that's solved by putting that database somewhere, and two groups of people live with, low, with bad latency. And so you can solve that by using Spanner as an actual global database, um, where you get much lower latency to, uh, to reads. And then finally, database consolidation. So where this has been really useful is if you think of, say, a system where you need to do um, some analytics and you've got your customer transactions in a MySQL database, you've got analytics sitting in a data warehouse, and you're pulling in log files from storage, and you want to bring them all into a single place, and you run analytics on top of that, you put them in reports, where you've got data basically in a lot of different places. 
and you've got to bring it together for a single source of truth before you can start doing reporting. Spanner can actually replace all of that. So Spanner can be that source of truth. It can be that um, location where everything goes anyway, and you run reporting on top of that. And so we saw that happen a great deal too. So after talking about Spanner in the abstract, how does this thing actually work? So um, it's pretty easy to create uh, a Spanner instance. I'm gonna walk through that um, shortly. Um, when you create an instance, uh, you're basically telling the Spanner service, what do you want your replication topology to look like? Um, you create a node, you create multiple nodes, however many nodes, within a particular reason, you, a region, um, and you select that region, um, and then each of those nodes has replicas across the region. And so all this data is getting replicated automatically across the region. Uh, a few um, limits, um, an instance, uh, an instance of Cloud Spanner can have up to 100 databases within it, and each database can have 2,000 tables, but within each table, you can have an unlimited number of rows. Um, the nodes themselves do have a limit per storage and um, QPS. So what happens when you try to do an update? Um, what happens when you try to write something to your Spanner instance? What happens is it comes into the cluster and Spanner, in some sort of magical way, uh, determines who's the owner of this particular data. Um, it is replicated across each zone, but each particular node, or within Spanner, there are particular nodes that own chunks of data. They are the primary writer of this data, and the rest of them are replicas. And so Spanner, again, more or less by magic, determines who that owner is and sends it to that owner, and they write it. Um, we use a uh, custom Paxos algorithm that allows us to do consensus-based writing that is not... Um, not all voters need to agree, it just need a majority. Um, and that gives us our global consistency, that gives us uh, an ability to quickly do writes but still be consistent. Um, there are times when we will do a uh, two-phase commit, um, especially if you're going across nodes, if the owners, if there's more than one owner of the data that you're writing. But we try to avoid that because our Paxos algorithm actually writes the data faster. But we want to do whatever we can to ensure that we have uh, global consistency. So. How does this actually work in, in terms of actually using it? Um, if we consider a kind of normal uh, relational database use case, um, let's think about these two uh, tables together. And so you have a, a singer's table and you've got an album table. Um, in a regular re relational database, you build out each table, uh, you make a primary key of singer ID, primary key album ID, and then if you wanted albums to be a child table, you make that a um, composite key or you make it a foreign key. And so you've got um, some foreign key constraints on top of that. Uh, as magical, or at least I believe it's magical, as magical as Spanner sounds, it can't do everything identically. There have to be trade-offs uh, with how it works. And the trade-offs are in particular with how tables relate to each other and how tables um, depend on each other. And so to do this in, Postg in Postgres, uh, in Spanner, uh, we do something slightly different. We actually interleave the tables together. Um, and this is essentially telling Spanner, this is data that I commonly query together. This is data I commonly update together. Please leave them in the same data location. And so that is what interleaving table does. From a conceptual point of view, this is the same thing as two related table with a parent-child relationship. And you set it up the same way. So you set up the artist table with you know, artist ID, artist name, and then an album table with album ID, album name, and then, but then you tell Spanner, instead of saying create a foreign key, I'm gonna interleave this table with the previous one, and I would like to, or if not, if you don't want to, inject a um, dependency on this, so if you delete one, I want you to delete the, uh, the child relationships. So what does this actually look like? If you're familiar with SQL, it should look pretty familiar, actually. This is actually valid um, DDL syntax for Spanner. So creating the singers table is pretty straightforward. I think that would run on most databases. Um, albums, again, pretty straightforward. And the real difference here is that you want to interleave sing uh, singers onto this database. And it's, so it's gonna know that singer ID is that primary key from the interleaving parent table. And you've made album ID the primary key as well. And so one thing that's really neat 
about Spanner, and is very different, I think, from relational databases in a good way, is that you can make table changes without taking your database offline. Um, you can make table changes live, and there's no interruption in your service or performance. And so let's say that we wanted to add an age to our singers table, then we just alter the table. And everyone continues, and that's now part of that table definition. And whoever's reading it and writing it will start using it right away, which is pretty cool, actually. And so how does this actually look in code? Um, like I said, we've got support for Go, Java, Python, um, Node.js right now. Um, this is Python code, in case you're not familiar. I'm not really a Python guy. Uh, I'm more Java, but somebody was kind enough to write this up for me, so I'm not going to really complain too much. Um, but the process is relatively similar um, everywhere. You could go to the command line, install this library um, from pip to pip install, um, Google Cloud Library, um, and then in your Python file, import the Spanner library, instantiate a client. You say, client, I would like um, an instance ID um, from Spanner. And then with that instance ID, um, you're going to grab your handle to your instance. And then once you grab the handle to the instance, you say, all right, I would like you to return me a handle to database of whatever name so I can get a handle on that database. And then you can start executing SQL. And this right here, this execute SQL statement, um, is just a regular SQL query. Um, as long as it's ANSI SQL 2011, it's going to be fine. And so you can just execute SQL queries right there, which is, for a lot of use cases, um, going to be very similar to what a lot of existing code already does. Um, so a couple of things that I want to touch on before I get to the demo is how does Spanner fit into the existing portfolio of cloud products? Um, I admit that this can get um, confusing and or daunting at times, especially if you're not familiar with how they all work. And so we do try to kind of spell out where we think um, the best recommendations are for each of these products. So if we want to start on, oh shoot, back. If we want to start on this side um, with Cloud SQL. So Cloud SQL is managed MySQL and Postgres. Um, and so if you've got, say, a web framework that relies on MySQL, like say, um, like Django or WordPress or what have you, that's a really good use case. If you've got a small data set, if you don't have high availability requirements where you can afford some measure of downtime, um, MySQL is a good fit there. Um, if you've got a NoSQL document store use case, it, this is a lot of web frameworks, a lot of um, websites use this. Uh, Cloud Data Store is really kind of a, a good option for that. Um, because Cloud Data Store is shared resources, you start by paying nothing, and then you pay as you use. And so you can really grow with Data Store. Um, probably the most well-known example of Data Store is Snapchat. So Snapchat started out real small. Um, they've gotten very big, and they've been using Data Store the whole time. Um, so you can really go from very, very small to very, very large on Data Store. On the other hand, uh, Bigtable is, Big Table is more of a, an analytics database. Um, very, very high speed, low latency, like single digit, uh, like single digit millisecond response times uh, for like time series data, for financial analyst analysis, uh, for IoT analysis. Big Table is really uh, particularly uh, well suited for that. Um, and then finally, over here is BigQuery. So BigQuery is a cloud. Um, enterprise data warehouse. Uh, it is for large-scale analytics, um, reporting, um, really the, the kind of endpoint for data so, so that it um, can be in a place that can be analyzed long-term. And so where Spanner fits into all of this is Spanner is good for mission-critical databases that require high availability, um, regional access, um, and then later on this year when we release multi-region, it'll be for um, this, uh, this global data plane use case that is kind of not well suited for the rest of these applications. And then the slide you guys got a sneak peek at. Um, we do yeah, understand, despite those explanations, sometimes it can kind of be hard to figure out where, where does my um, particular use case lie. Um, and so we, kinda, we came up with this flow chart. It's not 100% perfect, but it does help a great deal by making some kind of broad assumptions and broad decisions. And so 
the decision tree basically goes, your first decision, is this structured? If it's not structured, it really should go into object storage. So that's cloud storage. If you're using, or if you need to store unstructured data from a mobile platform, then what you can use is the Firebase um, SDK to get to Firebase storage, which is backed by cloud storage. On the other hand, um, so it is structured. If you have an analytics workload, what you really need to investigate, is it um, something that's gonna require updates, it's gonna require changes in low latency, in which case that's more of a big table use case. If not, then that's BigQuery. And then going down the main branch again, if it is non-relational data, then data store is a good use case if you're not um, using a mobile platform. And again, if you're using a mobile platform, Firebase Realtime DB is a great solution for non-relational database or data. And then finally, if you do have relational data, um, the decision comes down to, do you need that horizontal scalability? Do you need that higher availability? Um, in that case, the answer is Spanner. If not, then Cloud SQL works pretty well. Um, finally, before the, uh, the demo, um, you've probably heard in a couple of sessions today that uh, partner integrations are very important to us. We want to make sure that partners that you're working with, um, software that you're working with, works with our new and existing products. And so launching with uh, a lot of partners was really important to us. And we launched with um, X Plenty, Zoom Data, Look Looker, um, and we're working with a kind of pretty much anyone you're working with or using. We are working to make sure that they can, uh, that our shared customers will be able to take advantage of all the things that we create together. Um, and so, if we do support it today, I hope you're using it and taking advantage of it. If we're not, it's something we're actively working on. All right, so with that, um, we're gonna try this demo. Cool, it works. All right, so if you're going to um, start with Spanner, if you're curious about how it goes, I really, really strongly recommend looking at the documentation um, we really did spend a lot of time on this, a lot of iterations, and it is very, very extensive. Um, so it goes from concepts to quite a few how-to guides, diving into each of the um, uh, tutorials for each of the libraries, um, API reference, resources, all sorts of stuff. It's really actually very, very deep and extremely well done. So I strongly recommend checking out the, um, uh, the documentation. So now what I'm gonna do in um, in my own uh, cloud console is I'm actually gonna create a uh, Spanner instance. And it's bookmarked because Spanner is awesome. And I'm gonna show you just kind of how quickly this can be done. So oh, let's call this next. And it's gonna autofill that. We're going to select Europe because that's where we're sitting. And let's say 10 nodes I think is enough for here. Um, and it'll show you how much it costs per hour. It has some guidance around what kind of capacity the, each of these nodes are capable of and kind of what you're signing up for. And we're gonna create that and let's see. Oh dear, it took like three seconds. What are they doing? Um, so anyway, this is actually live. This is not um, some sort of nicety that the console does for you. This is actually um, a live status of your cluster as, or instance rather, as soon as you create it. So this is up and running. So those 10 nodes are now mine. Um, but all you've done is kind of create a spanner for lack of a better term, and this is not the same kind of thing. It's essentially a container of databases. You haven't created any databases, nothing to query, nothing to insert, so you've gotta go ahead and create a database. And so why don't we replicate the example from earlier. We're gonna create a, a small um, music database. Um, and I'm just gonna create these in the console. These are all options that you could do from, um, uh, from the command line and from, there we go, uh, from any of the libraries. And so I'm just doing this because obviously it's a little easier. Oh, I, artists, that's not the primary key. There we go. So artist ID, this keyboard is not um, an English keyboard. So we're gonna require that, we're gonna add let's say artist name, and we'll make that a string. Ah, oh, I did it again. There, okay. And we'll require the name as well. We'll continue, we'll make the artist ID the primary key, 
and away we go. And so now what we're going to do is actually add that um, the interleave tile table. So we'll call this album. And we're going to interleave this. We're going to interleave it with artists. It's the only choice, but you could have a drop down of whatever tables you have in this database. We're also going to say cascade on delete. So delete parent child rows together. And so in this case, we inherit artist ID automatically um, because we've already told Spanner that it's going to be interleaved. And I'm going to make an album ID required. Um, and we're going to make a album name. And we're going to make that a string and say it's also required. Done. Continue. And again, because we're inheriting this as an interleave table, part of the primary key is already the parent um, primary key. And it's requiring a composite key. So we're going to select um, album ID as the second part of the composite key. And we're done. And so now we can go ahead and create our database. And in a couple seconds, yep, we have tables with columns that we can start reading and writing from. Um, but as I sit here and think about it, I really think uh, we should edit um, albums because when you're looking at albums, you probably want to look at a release date. Um, that seems pretty important. So why don't we add release date and make that um, a date type. Yes, we're going to require that too. Done. Save. And we've updated our database, and we haven't told it to go offline. We haven't had um, a maintenance window. We just kind of continued along as, um, as before. Um, this is a pretty neat feature of the console in that you can look at the equivalent DDL for any of the uh, tables. And in fact, the entire database um, has the same feature. So if we go up here, um, we'll see the DDL for this uh, database. And that's available to you kind of at any point. Um, another feature that we have is for the database, you can look at um, the monitoring on that database as you're using it. So CPU, operations per second, throughput, and so on. This is on every single database. And in fact, for the instance itself, also has that same monitoring enabled right away. Um, so you can look at node count and um, some similar features. And you know, now that we've been using this for a little bit, um, I realize I'm massively over-provisioned. So I think 10 nodes is way too much. Why don't we go down to five and save that. And uh, our spanner instance has continued, again, without downtime. Um, again, without end users um, being affected at all, um, because apparently we were over-provisioned, and so um, everything continues just fine. So now what I'm going to do is uh, go into a different Spanner um, database that was created by one of my colleagues, conveniently called Europe Spanner Demo Instance. Um, and this has quite a bit more data in it, so at least we can do some queries here. Um, and so this database is backing um, essentially a ticket, uh, a ticketing uh, application. Think like uh, Ticketmaster or something like that, where you have um, artists who go on tours to different venues, um, which have certain number of tickets and ticket categories. Um, and users who come in and purchase tickets spend a certain amount of money. And so they need accounts and they need financial information. So a relatively classic um, kind of relational database use case. This is something that you really need strong transactions. When people buy tickets for concerts, they probably expect those to actually happen. Um, so if we look at this database, again, we've got a few indexes on some tables. We've got some interleave tables, some children tables in places that you may imagine. Um, we're using about 600 gigs. So let's do a query, and let's take advantage of writing things down. So I'm going to take this query. And what we're looking for is um, events in the Netherlands at venues that have a significant percentage of unsold tickets. So you could imagine making this query and saying, well, you know, these couple of venues for these events don't have, um, you know, are, are largely unsold. Let's do a marketing event. Let's do a special, something like that. Um, so let's run a query on what, what's available here. Um, and we've got two venues uh, that have 9,664 seats available. And uh, that's the total number of seats. So it looks like there is zero sold on that first one. And the second one, same story. So they are not doing well. Uh, whatever this event is, it's not very popular. Um, and with every query that you make uh, through the console, you can actually look at the explain plan. Um, and you can look at kind of uh, what happened, uh, what did the optimizer do, how did Spanner um, go through the query and um, read your data and, and find your data. And so you can dive into that. Um, 
we previously looked at this and said, you know, there's probably an optimization we can make here um, to make this a little bit better. Um, we took about three quarters of a second to run the query and scanned um, nearly 15,000 rows. So what we're going to do is actually, and this is one of the features that we have in um, the SQL spec, is being able to force an index on the query. And so we're going to force an index on, um, oh dear, I've lost it. <laughs> Where's demo two? Oh dear. Um, we're going to force it on here. Um, so this is the syntax. On, I think event date. So here we go. We're going to try this on the fly. Um, and see if it runs. No, it didn't. Nope. This is why you write things down. Nope. All right. I'm terribly sorry. So if that had worked, <laughs> um, basically what you can do is modify your query by looking at the explain plan. It's something I strongly recommend. I also strongly recommend writing things down in the right places. Um, but <laughs> so I do apologize for that. That's uh, not what I meant to do. But um, it does give you a lot of versatility and a lot of tooling enabled to enable you to actually analyze your queries. So if you're having queries that are running in ways that you don't expect, um, if you think they're taking too long, if you think they're not working or returning the right number of rows, do look at the explain plan. Do look at what Spanner is actually doing when you execute that query. And you can really actually get quite a bit out of that. It might be things like force index. It might be things like um, interleaving different tables. It might be things like adding indexes to tables. So um, do look at that. There is a lot of information there in order to um, help you along and to, uh, to kind of improve how you interact with Spanner. Um, but on that note, um, uh, that's it, and I'll be happy to take any Q&A. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, could you use, are there microphones around? Oh, yeah, could you use a microphone, please? Yep, question? Oh, yep. Is there a Hibernate dialect for uh, CloudSpan already? Is there a what dialect? A Hibernate for Java. You're a Java developer. <laughs> we oh, uh, use oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Next question. Right here. I have a few simple questions. Uh, first is, uh, does the spanner do back backups or something like this? I didn't solve this. It's something that the Spanner team is working on right now. It is not something that exists in the product today. OK. Uh, the second question, uh, you said that Spanner uh, don't do need downtime. So how do Spanner make uh, re-indexing of uh, a bloated index when uh, there are a lot of updates on uh, RDMS? You have to uh, re-index the index because uh, it's too large to data it has. Do you do spanner need re index or uh, it run automatically? No, it, it would, I'm, I'm not sure I got your whole question, but we don't do automatic indexes. You can create indexes on tables. No, I'm asking. Oh. Uh, Sorry. Oh, good work. Uh, I'm asking when, uh, so another, uh, another way. Uh, does this panel do vacuum out, auto vacuum or oh, something like this? Oh, auto vacuum. OK, like, uh, like, like garbage collection and, yeah, and cleaning exactly. up rows and stuff like that. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, also with indexes or not? Uh, or do you know? I believe so, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. OK, yep. thanks. Any other questions? Yep, right there. Yeah. Hi. Um, is uh, Google planning on? Good, I'm sorry. Is that, is that work? Sorry, is this better? Yeah, 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 really close to the mic, please. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is Google planning on ever uh, open sourcing this technology? Um, sorry, what? Open sourcing 
the the good spanner technology? Uh, open sourcing spanner as uh, a technology. Um, I don't believe that is part of the plan um, right now. Yeah, I, I don't think so. So that means no uh, on-premise uh, installations ever. Uh, well, I mean, we do have a lot of white papers that describe how Spanner actually works. Um, so it's theoretically possible. And in fact, actually, I can't remember the name. Somebody has actually created an open source. Hmm? Cockroach, thank you, yes. Is an open source um, version of Spanner that's based off the Spanner paper. Um, but that was not released by us. Any other questions? One more here. Hi, thank Hi. you for the presentation. Very interesting. The question is about so it is like globally scalable, but at the same time transactional database, right? Do, how do you deal with the logs of the tables or records, etc.? And does it affect the user's experience globally? Um, we don't lock tables or rows. Um, you can go into more detail in the, uh, the paper, which will explain it better than I can. But loosely speaking, it is based off of um, uh, timestamps. So we are pretty. We have an extensive timestamp system. It's mostly based on um, satellites and uh, atomic clocks in the data centers. So we have as precise as we possibly can with an acknowledged amount of drift, um, timestamps for every single transaction. And they are reconciled by a master. In a regional, re in a regional setup, there's a, somebody who's in charge and we, we elect leaders on a relatively regular basis um, that is in charge of deciding what, is, uh, what came before and what came after. And so we have ordered transactions that way. And so you expand that to, the global, um, to a global setup and it, it kind of functions the same sort of way, but it, it's mostly based off of that. Um, but you can get a lot more and probably better detail from uh, the white papers. In fact, actually, um, as part of the, the documentation website, um, there are links to all the white papers that have to do with Spanner. So the original uh, Spanner paper that came out about 10 years ago, they did an update one this year. And there was one that um, was uh, written by um, Eric Brewer to specifically discuss how Spanner handles the cap theorem. Um, which uh, actually goes into a lot of what you just discussed about how to reconcile when, um, which transaction wins um, when they come in. And it, a lot of it has to do with being, um, having really good timestamps, but then also acknowledging that nothing's perfect. Okay, one small question. Sure. So it is only cloud solution, yeah? We cannot use it as on-premises. Uh, unless you want to use Cockroach, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Cocktail hour. Thank you very much, everyone.